Well, Dr. Mechner, before we start talking about the fascinating things you've done in your career, I'd like to know a little bit about your present uh, professional affiliation and title and so forth. Um, I'm an independent. I'm not affiliated formally with any university or organization, although I am a trustee of the Cambridge Center for Behavioral Studies. Yes. And I work with uh, people in different universities, like at Barnard, Columbia University of North Texas, uh, City University of New York, and uh, University of New Hampshire. I, I have collaborators, associates who work with me in different uh, laboratories around the country. Would you consider yourself a consultant then, or an independent psychologist? No, I, or I, I would. I consider myself an independent psychologist uh, okay. who pursues the ideas that interest him. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, if a student, a high school student, uh, asked you what you do for a living, what would you tell them? Uh, I would tell them that's a difficult question to answer because I'm also uh, a business entrepreneur in innovative technology ventures. Oh, and that's I've uh, done that for 30 years really? uh, uh -huh. in many different fields, uh, which have in common only the fact that they all involve innovative uh, technologies of various kinds, uh, some of them related to the behavioral sciences and some not. Well, that's fascinating. It, lots of fun, it sounds. <laughs> uh, do you consider yourself a behaviorist? Well, in order to answer that question, I, have to, I would have to know what a behaviorist is. Uh, <laughs> and I really was never able to figure that out. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'm certainly interested in behavior. Uh, uh, in, in all its facets, but some people mean something different than that by behaviorist. So I, I always find it difficult to answer that question. And Fair enough. Uh, I try to evade it because I don't want to be pigeonholed as <laughs> having a particular ideological orientation, which may not be exactly what my orientation is. Well, then let me ask you another one, which yes. you probably have to answer the same way. Um, but uh, I'll try it anyway. Do you consider yourself a behavior analyst? Well, again, um, I'm certainly a member of ABBA, which is uh, <laughs> uh, the association of people who call themselves that. And I do analyze behavior, and I study behavior in the laboratory and uh, as, a, as a research pursuit. So I guess in that sense, I'm a behavior analyst. <laughs> what right. else could I be? <laughs> um, before you uh, embarked on this independent career, uh, did you have previous professional affiliations? No. I. Um, I received my PhD in experimental psychology at Columbia University. I was on the faculty there for a number of years teaching experimental psychology. And, uh, and then I, I was an active labor laboratory researcher in, in the field of learning and yeah. behavior. Uh, what would be the years of your uh, tenure at Columbia, let's say? It was, um, I did my undergraduate work there, from 1948 to 52. Then uh, I did my graduate work there from um, from 52 to 56. <coughs> uh, my teaching tenure there was from uh, 54 to 59. And um, well, that's it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, and then yeah. at that point, you embarked on your uh, um, independent work. Actually, that began to happen in in 61. Yes, in 61, I began to uh, to do entrepreneurial. Uh, activity, I undertook uh, my an entrepreneurial endeavors, uh, uh, first in the field of learning and programmed learning, uh, programmed instruction, and uh, then gradually expanding into other fields. Okay. Uh, before we go on uh, into some of the things you've done, I'd like to know a little bit more about Francis Mechner. Can you tell us about where you grew up and where you went to high school and a few things like that? Uh, yes, uh, I was born in Vienna, Austria. Um, uh, I lived there for the first seven years of my life. Um, my family was chased out by Hitler, and then we became refugees. And we were, uh, I traveled around a bit. I spent three years in France, then three years in Cuba, and, and I came here at the age of uh, 12. So I've been an American since, since that time and grew up. I mean, had my, my high school years were in, in New York. In New York City. In, in New York City, and uh, in, in actually in Brooklyn, New York. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I went to Columbia then, uh, and that, that's, that's the story, basically. Uh, what school did you graduate, high school did you graduate from? Erasmus Hall High School, which, which was a Brooklyn high school. And what year did you graduate? 48. 48. Mm -hmm. And then you went, uh, your only undergraduate uh, college work was at Columbia? Yes. Yes. And when did yes. you get your bachelor's degree? In 52. Was that a BS or a BA? Uh, it was a b BA, mm -hmm. BA, yes. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, well, when you were in high school, uh, what, uh, uh, even before high school, let's say, did you have any particular career goals? Did you uh, have any particular fields that fascinated you, that you thought you might grow up to make a living at? Well, I was... Uh, really preoccupied with uh, what makes people tick and why we are what we are and do what we do. And uh, I sort of uh, searched for the field that would be most likely to give me those answers. So I took a great deal of science uh, as an undergraduate. I took a lot of chemistry, a lot of physics, a lot of biology. Um, uh, played with the idea of going into medicine uh, for a while, but uh, but when I ran into Keller and Schoenfeld at Columbia and uh, Professor Ernest Nagel in, in philosophy, uh, I decided that that's where I was going to get my answers and went into that field, yes. Uh, when you were I in high school or even previously, what were your, some of your hobbies and avocations? Well, um, I was really a painter uh, from the time I was very young until uh, until about the age of uh, 20. Um, yeah. I did very little but paint, as a matter of fact. Uh, and uh, I did become a pianist. Um, for a while, I, I toyed with the idea of becoming a concert pianist, so I did that very intensely for a number of my teenage years. Uh, um, I took up chess during those years, so that, that was sort of my, my life at that time, painting, mm -hmm. music, and chess. And it wasn't until I was uh, close to 20, 21, that I discovered uh, that experimental psychology and learning theory was going, was going to give real meaning to my life, yeah. I see. Yeah. So uh, you encountered uh, behavioral psychology. You studied that in school for the first time at Columbia? Yes. A as an undergraduate? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. it's the first time I, I even learned that there was such a thing, mm -hmm. of course, yes. And uh, this is where you encountered Keller and Schoenfeld. Huh? Yes, I took, uh, I took uh, Psych 1, as, mm -hmm. as it was called at Columbia, which was Keller's introductory course, which was a lab course. It was a laboratory course uh, with rats. Every student had his own rat, and, uh, and that's how we were indoctrinated, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, did you use the textbook, uh, Keller and Schoenfeld? Uh, yes, indeed, yes, yes uh, indeed. Uh, what, um, could you give me, uh, let's say, a time fix, uh, what year in college was it where you decided you were going to be a psychologist? Let me think. Um, I believe it was my, close to the end of my third year. I, I think I took the Keller and Schoenfeld course in my third year. And uh, that really took hold. And I think the next semester, yeah, uh, I took two other courses, Professor Nagel's course in epistemology, and simultaneously I took, I took uh, Schoenfeld, Schoenfeld's verbal behavior seminar and Hefferlein's abnormal psychology course. Hefferlein was, was another guy who influenced me pretty strongly. He was quite a remarkable scientist. Um, perhaps underappreciated at that time in the psychology mm -hmm. department, but uh, he was at that time developing uh, what he called experiments in self-awareness, which he was developing with uh, his associates Fritz Perls uh, and Goodman. And later they came out with a book called Gestalt Therapy. Uh, oh. Uh, ha ha Pearls, Hefferline, Goodman, Hefferlein, Pearls, I don't know in what order the three authors were, were named. Um, but those, in that course, that experimental psych course, Hefferlein gave out these sheets, experiments in self-awareness, they were mimeographed sheets. And 
the exercise for the class, the assignment for the class, was to do those at home uh, as, as an exercise. And I did them very religiously. Uh, Tell me what an exercise fabulous. in self-awareness would be. Um, it was a combination of, of um, exploring your, your tensions in your body, uh, your thoughts, um, being here and now. Um, I really don't remember the details now, but they were sort of what we would today call the human potential, uh, human potential movement type exercises. At that time, there was no such thing. Uh, this was 19, early 1950s. Uh, it was 1950. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was uh, that way of thinking was the precursor of what sh much of what later became incorporated into these workshops and uh, and uh, uh, self-development programs like EST mm -hmm. and actualizations and many others. Um, but um, Hefferlein was an extremely fine thinker and scientist. Uh, later on, when I became a graduate student, my lab happened to be next to his. And I used to work there like into the small hours of the morning, every, every single night. And there was only one other person on the floor at that time. There was Heffelein. He would work until 2 o'clock, <laughs> regularly, until 2 a.m., struggling with his electronics, which he wasn't good at. because. <laughs> He had come out of the uh, garment industry. Really? You know, he got his PhD at 40, and before that, he had been a, a uh, an executive in the garment company. Uh, Fascinating. He was an <laughs> outstanding person. Um, well, anyway, that's this digression. I, I, <laughs> well, I just happen to one. remember <laughs> that Heffelein was another strong influence on my decision. And uh, it was par partly these uh, experiments in self-awareness that helped me convince myself that I really had to go into mm -hmm into psychology, into experimental psychology. That, that, that's where my passion and interest lay. Well, that was one question I was going yeah. to ask you. Who were the people who influenced you the most? Well, Schoenfeld uh, uh, had, had a big role. Um, there was a real interplay between Schoenfeld's course in verbal behavior. It's, uh, it was actually a graduate, a graduate seminar in verbal behavior. And the, the course in epistemology that I was taking with Ernest Nagel and in both of the, uh, the theme that came out of both of those courses for me was that um, we perceive what we learn to perceive and we know what we learn to know. Uh, in fact, Nagel's the te textbook that we used in Nagel's course was called The Conditions of Knowing by Angus Sinclair. Um, and um, as you can imagine, that interacted very meaningfully with, with Schoenfeld's orientation in, and Skinner's orientation in verbal behavior. So it was those things that uh, really hooked me. Uh, uh. Now, what year did you find it? Did you get a master's degree? Yeah, on the way I picked up a master's in, in 54, I guess. Yes, I did. Yes. And that was an MA yes, in psychology. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, what uh, did you have a minor subject, incidentally, in either in your undergraduate or your graduate years, graduate school? Years? You know, I, I did something pretty unorthodox. Um, I guess it could have been considered a minor in my graduate work, but um, I wasn't satisfied with the offerings of the psychology department uh, to the exclusion of other things. I mean, I was thrilled by what they were offering, but I felt that it wasn't complete for me. So I went over into the, um, at Columbia you could take any, once you were a graduate student, you could take any course in any department. So I went to the electrical engineering department, took a bunch of courses there, went to the math department, learned a lot of math, a lot of statistics. Um, I went to the zoology department and took a course in uh, symbolic logic as applied to biology. I took anthropology courses um, with, uh, uh, with uh, John Wagley, uh, who is now dead. Um, I took physics. I, I, I just took a wide variety of courses in other departments. So I guess you could call that a minor, but I just felt that in order to be a well-rounded scientist, I would have to broaden myself beyond what the psych department was offering. That sounds like a fascinating and 
and good idea. <laughs> well, I, I took many, many more points uh, than than <laughs> were required for a minor. Yeah, for no, for, well, I mean, for, for well, my PhD for, as yeah, well. Yeah, right. right. Certainly. Uh, well, uh, did you take any uh, postdoctoral uh, work? Yeah. Well, it's still going on. I'm still okay. doing postdoctoral <laughs> work. <laughs> All right. Um, did you see any military service? No, yeah. no. And let's say, um, some questions here I don't need to answer. <laughs> what were your career goals um, when you were, let's say, in, uh, your, in grad during graduate school here? What uh, did you hope to become or what did you hope to accomplish? Well, I wanted to make uh, big earth-shaking scientific contributions. That, that's, that's all I really had in mind. <laughs> A modest goal, <laughs> and and to f and to learn as much as I could learn, and 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 figure out the rest. Right. Uh, what uh, would you consider to be the three most influential articles and the three most influential books you've ever read? Oh boy. Well, you know, different things influenced me differently at different times in my career. Uh, you know, I, I could go back you know, to childhood when things influenced me, but they're trivial, you know, by mm -hmm. by adult standards. Um, um, well, I would have to say that the Keller and Schoenfeld textbook, uh, Principles of Psychology, was very influential for me. Um, that book I mentioned earlier, um, uh, Angus Sinclair's Conditions of Knowing, influenced me, that, although I haven't looked at it since I took that course. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I was influenced by a lot of Freud's writings before I ever <laughs> made contact with uh, psycho with with Columbia's psycho with behavioral psychology or with uh, learning theory. Uh, <coughs> learning theory is a term they don't use much anymore, but at that time we called it learning theory, reinforcement theory. There was no the term behavior analysis is a fairly new term. Uh, it, it, we didn't know that, that term at that time. Um, so, um, what other books? Um, well, Skinner's uh, behavior of organisms was was interesting to me. Uh, verbal uh, his science and human behavior was was an important book in my in my development. Yes, um, and then uh, um, a Holton's book. Uh, oh, what was it called? Gerald Holton's. He was a Harvard physics professor. Uh, some uh, something about principles of. Uh, uh, scientific research or science, something about uh, method and theory in physical, th that's what it's called, method and theory in physical science. It's a very, very fine book. Um, in fact, I later used it as a textbook in my experimental course, uh, which, I w which I taught uh, for those years. Um, Well, maybe that'll mm -hmm. do for the mm -hmm. time being. If you think of anything else, yeah. Right, yeah. You know. uh, now, as I understand it, you started your operant research with animals. Yes, yes. And that's that correct. was in your undergraduate days. Right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, how many kinds of animals did you work with during your course? Well, in the in the Psych One Two course uh, that that Keller taught, uh, it was rats. Yes. We we used rats, and in the course I taught then later. Uh, when I began to teach in '54, uh, I taught the experimental psychology course. Uh, uh, I, I had three sections of, of an experimental, a five-point experimental psych course, and I used rats and humans for different experiments. I had one experiment per week, one one topic per week, and for about half the topics I used rats, and for the other half of the topics I used humans. Like concept formation, I used humans. For psychophysics, I used humans, and there was number of other topics. So. Uh, do you feel that animal research is relevant to human psychology? I think we can learn a great deal from, from any species, and there are uh, similarities, and similarities and differences between species. So um, based on the similarities, we can learn what to look for in another species and and the differences uh, um, um, 
sharpen our concepts. So in order to form concepts in everything, one needs to become aware of differences and similarities. So studying different species uh, helps form concepts of any given species, the behavior of any given. Yeah. And if you could, um, could you put a, a quantitative value, if you had to rate the how relevant uh, animal research is to human psychology on a scale of one to four, with four being the high end, what would you say? Four. Okay. <laughs> Now, um, what are some of the psychological problems that you have tackled with the methods that you learned uh, in your graduate, undergraduate and graduate years? Well, that last qualification, uh, I don't know how to s uh, separate, you know, wh what I learned in my undergraduate and graduate no, years. No, you don't have to. I yeah. just mean in the, in the total uh, of your in psychological oh, schooling. Oh, okay. Um, I've always been interested in the topic of how one learns, how skills are learned, how knowledge is acquired, uh, on the quality of the skills. Performance learning is one of my areas of specialty now. I've worked in the field of performance learning, learning skilled performance. I've worked in that area for the past, uh, well, my whole career really. but quite intensely for the past 15 years. Well, what kinds of kill, skills did you uh, By do? skilled performance, I mean a wide range of things like playing musical instruments, language, learning a foreign language, uh, sports like tennis or bowling or, uh, or, uh, uh, or karate, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, games like chess, or the oriental strategy game of Go, uh, Bridge. Uh, those are all examples of skilled performance. Have you worked on uh, all examples of all of those, would you say? Not all of them. I, I've worked very intensely on piano because I'm, I'm a pianist, so I have special access to that, to that field. Uh, being a chess player, I, I've been very interested in how chess can be learned and improved. Um, and Go, which is the Oriental strategy game, which I'm also uh, uh, a student of. Um, art, drawing, for example, um, is another example of a skilled performance. Uh, sports, not so much, um, although I'm, I'm interested in, in uh, sp sports performance as well. But those are the areas in which I've sort of concentrated and from which I draw my my cases and my examples. Um, does that answer your question? I think so. Um, could you tell me, uh, have you applied these actually? Oh, uh, yes. yes. Do you take, uh, you might say, clients and teach them how to play chess better? And yes. Uh -huh. Well, not clients uh, in the well, sense uh, okay. of paying clients, yeah. but, uh, but, but subjects. All right. Now, um, uh, what about in education, let's say, in teaching foreign languages? Ha has it been applied in any, you might say, practical applications in education? I've experimented with, with subjects uh, in a wide range of, of mm -hmm. skill areas. Um, I've worked with concert pianists, for example, uh, teaching them some of the techniques and methods that I've developed and uh, collecting data on their performance before, during, and after. Um, in language learning, I've experimented in, on a small scale. Uh, chess learning, uh, I've experimented. Sometimes I've used myself as a subject, uh, going, th putting myself through some exercises that I've developed to see what the effect is of doing such exercises. That's the kind of thing I've. Mm -hmm. Would you call this uh, fairly pure research in quotes, or would you say it falls more in the category of applied uh, research? It's. Uh, some of it is basic research. Some of it is, uh, is um, basic and fairly general uh, research in the sense of developing a, a, a science of performance learning. But then that science is easily converted into a technology of performance learning, meaning a uh, knowledge that you can apply to achieve practical results. So it's both. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, have you? Um, developed uh, any uh, uh, methods for, you might say, improving learning in industrial skills and uh, 
Well, much of my career has been in, in the field of training and education and learning. My original company, uh -huh. wh whose name was Basic Systems, uh, is a company through which I introduced programmed learning, programmed instruction, apart from teaching machines, which is all it was up to that time. Right. Uh, you may recall that Skinner uh, came up with the notion of a teaching machine and the program that goes into it. Well, my idea was that the, the attention must be focused on the program and that the machine is incidental. And that was a basis for the first company that I, that I organized, Basic Systems, which later became Xerox Learning Systems. Oh, OK. Yes, that was quite a start. <laughs> um, it, it worked out it very well. It led right yeah, into the uh, uh, program texts, and I assume the computer. Well, uh, we were the first to mm -hmm. to commercialize program texts. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. There were others who who played with it in at about the same time in the university settings, but we were the first to to use programmed learning to achieve practical results. When we, when were you doing this work? And uh, I began my work in in programmed instruction and programmed learning in. 1959. Uh, it was right after Skinner published his article called Teaching Machines. Uh, I saw that article. I said, wow, I've, I've <laughs> got to get into this. And uh, then uh, you went on. Uh, when would you say it became? When, when did you form a, a company? 1960. 1960. Yeah. And when did Xerox take it over? Uh, four and a half years later, in, in early 1965. Is Xerox still doing this kind of work? Well, what uh, happened to it is uh, they paid us a lot of money for the company. And uh, they ended up with just a few products th uh, that we developed that, that did very well. One of them was professional selling skills, generally known as PSS. But that became, in their hands, the most widely used training system of all time. Um, and they made a, a, in their hands, it became a big product. They, it, it reached a level of sales of close to $100 million a year. And then they sold the whole company to the Los Angeles Times Mirror for $115 million. <laughs> and the Los Angeles Times Mirror uh, put it into a division called Learning International. So today, Learning International is still selling that product. My at a level of like over a hundred million dollars a year, so <laughs> it really that uh, that product line really did well. This is the the selling skills. Yes, part of it called professional yeah. selling skills, PSS. Uh, what other kinds of uh, fields uh, did they go into, or did you go into first, and uh, that they we, took over? Uh, uh, we developed many kinds of educational programs for industry for physician education, postgraduate medical education, teaching doctors about new developments in different fields of medicine, like electrocardiography and hypertension and thyroid disease and renal physiology and uh, endocrinology, uh, uh, on and on. We just did many, one course after another for doctors to keep up with new developments in medicine. And for nurses, uh, again, to train nurses in the different fields of uh, of, of, of their profession, of, of, the, of the medical profession. And um, uh, courses for industrial training for IBM and DuPont and uh, the computer companies of that time, which uh, when the computer uh, industry got started and uh, many things in electronics and courses for schools, secondary schools and physics, chemistry, biology, uh, logic, math, many math courses, on and on like that. So we, we developed many kinds of training systems and courses, but the main clients were industry. And uh, we made our success. In fact, Xerox was one of our customers, and it was oh. because of the good work we did for them that they became interested in buying us. I see. Now, are these uh, projects still going on? Is Learning International some uh, more than the selling? I think I mean? Learning International has ten has dropped most of the other, or has sold off most of the other things, um, and uh, is now um, concentrating on 
on selling skills and associated courses, uh, like supervisory training and um, management education of all kinds. Uh. I can see how something like that <laughs> could go where you don't know where it is anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yes, it, it, I, mm. I did lose track of it pretty much. Uh. Did your company actually get into any of the computerized, computer-assisted instruction? No, no. It was, it, before it, it was before time. the technology was up to that. It's only recently, really, that computer-assisted instruction is coming into its own, mm -hmm. where the hardware can do interesting and worthwhile things. It's clearly an offshoot of that kind of thing, though, I would think. Oh, yes. Uh, well, the underlying, uh, I believe, my main contribution um, uh, uh, in, in the field of, of training systems is the emphasis on behavioral analysis, that is, on analyzing the underlying behavior that is to be learned. I've always believed that the, te the method, the technique, whether it's programmed instruction or computer-assisted instruction or even conventional textbooks or lecture or tutoring or whatever, is secondary. That, that primary is the correct analysis of the skills and knowledge to be taught and the identification of the uh, not only the overt behavior, that is what the student will have to be able to do overtly, but also the covert aspects of the behavior, namely what he should be thinking and what he should be visualizing even when you can't see him doing it. Like for example, if you teach somebody chess, y you can't tell what a chess player is doing by watching him. You can see his move, but that doesn't tell you Wha the, what the essential behavior was, namely the thought processes and the an analytical processes that he went through to arrive at that move. And he's and certainly not going to tell you while you're playing chess well, he against him. <laughs> he, well, he, he, he may not even be able to tell you. Uh, you know, there are concepts which are primarily visual, and y some people call it intuition, but, but there are concepts which are not easily verbalized. Um, so the, uh, the challenge to a teacher and a coach is to shape those covert behaviors in addition to the overt ones, which are the easily observed ones. Fascinating. Well, in all this work that you've been doing, um, ha have uh, there been any uh, principles from the animal laboratories, let's say, uh, that you feel translate most readily to this type of situation? Well, um, yes, there are some principles that you can study with animals, uh, some, some behavior dynamics which are easily studied and productively studied with animals, and others that are not. Um, um, take, for example, the concept of uh, the mechanism of resurgence or regression. Um, what that means is, you know, regression is a term that f it comes from Freud's writings, uh, that an individual goes back to an earlier form of behavior when, when the current behavior is put under stress, or when, when there is some blockage of, of, of a performance, you go back to an earlier form. Well, uh, we're studying that in animals right now in a, in a number of places, uh, and with humans as well. Um, but uh, I believe that the the mechanism of regression and res resurgence. I prefer the term resurgence. Uh, that is, old behavior resurges. It, it surfaces again, uh, even though it hasn't been seen for a long time. Well, you get resurgence um, all the time. I think there is very little of our everyday flow of behavior that isn't under some kind of stress. Uh, blockages occur, you forget a word, uh, you encounter a little obstacle, something bothers you, something disturbs you. Behavior is constantly buffeted by, by the forces of, of, of the circumstances that surround it. Uh, well, under those um, stresses, if I can call them that, um, regression occurs all the time. And when behavior is, is uh, interfered with, what takes its place? It's always older behavior. It's always previous behavior. The individual must dip into his past 
repertoire and history in order to maintain his stream of behavior when the current behavior is in some way disrupted. So resurgence and regression are mechanisms that I believe explain much of what we're concerned with clinically and in education and training. And these are mechanisms which I believe can readily be studied with animals, in many cases better, because you see them in purer and simpler, more understandable form and you can in the laboratory. You can manipulate the critical variables in the laboratory in a way that you can't always easily do with human subjects. But we are studying resurgence and regression in human subjects as well as in animals right now. Are you uh, doing any of this uh, work, this resurgence, regression research yourself now? Yes, yes, yep. yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have uh, currently, have you made any current uh, or recent, let's say, applications uh, in the clinical field? No, I'm not a clinician. Mm -hmm. But I, I always think about clinical uh, uh, ramifications and implications of, of what I do. And I write about them and I talk about them, but I don't work with patients in th that sense. I don't work in the clinical setting. What uh, accomplishment would you say you are most proud of? <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm proud of anything, but uh, when I was uh, uh, in my 20s, my late 20s, I developed a notation system for behavioral contingencies. Um, it was published in JAB, a um, uh, paper called A Notation System for the Description of Behavioral Procedures. and. That became fairly widely used. Um, it's still being used. Uh, some people are teaching. Jack Michael taught it for a while, and it found its way into a number of textbooks. And uh, teachers here and there uh, teach it. Uh, it was used in Brazil, or it still is. I don't know. Uh, so that, that's a good notation system. It's, it's a good general purpose notation system for behavioral contingencies and for social interaction contingencies, like competition, cooperation. You can analyze these dynamics by means of that system. So I'm pr uh, I'm pleased with that, uh, but I think my most important work is probably the um, the revealed operant, as I now call it. Uh, in my earlier days, I called it a, mul a multi-response operant. Could you ex please explain what you mean? Yeah, by the, revealed it, it, operant? the the underlying idea is that if you want to study operant behavior, an operant, uh, it's useful to to define the unit of the operant not as a single response, like a single bar press or a single key peck or a single button push, which is all or none. It either happens or doesn't happen. But to define it as, as a larger unit that has a, a behaviorally marked beginning and a behaviorally marked end, so that you can look at the internal structure of it, uh, the patterns that occur within it, uh, the time parameters, the spatial parameters, there, there are many kinds of such operants, and we have been working with that. But uh, it's that idea that you can define an operant as a as a um, as a sequence uh, or a pattern of of behavior, rather than just as an instantaneous all or none occurrence. Uh, that's a that's a tool that you can use to study reinforcement, how reinforcers work, how they impact behavior, uh, what happens during extinction. Uh, what happens when behavior comes under stresses of various kinds, and such phenomena as I just described before, resurgence or regression. If you want to look at uh, how behavior uh, regresses to earlier forms or how earlier forms resurge under conditions of stress, you need to know more about the behavior, about the operant than just whether or not it occurred. You be have to be able to fingerprint it, so to speak, so that you can you can uh, relate it and track it and, uh, to, to earlier forms so, uh, so that you can look at patterns. And that's the kind of work we're doing now. Okay. And the other thing I'm doing is performance learning, which I talked about earlier. So uh, I would say that uh, my current work in performance learning and the revealed operant technique and uh, the notation system is something I left behind uh, 40, 30, 40 years ago. I mean, that, that's, but it, uh, but those, are, if you, yeah, those could, are the things I'm pleased with. Could you give us an ex Is it possible to describe uh, a couple of elements of this notation system? Well, it has just a few symbols. One symbol is R followed by an arrow. 
Now that means if R then, if a response then. Um, an S is a stimul for, uh, for stimulus, and the stimulus um, prevails. Some stimulus always prevails in that notation system. Um, it has an onset and an end. Uh, when there's a stimulus change, that's another S event. Um, and then there are brackets that show simultaneity, so that when a stimulus begins at the same time as a contingency begins, they are shown vertically above each other with a bracket around them. OK, I think I yeah. use it. <laughs> I don't think I knew oh, where it oh, came right. from. That's, that's my notation. Yeah, at least yeah. uh, partially, uh -huh. at least. Maybe uh -huh. not in its pure form, but I, I use that in some of my uh -huh. classwork. Well, uh, novelty is certainly the uh, stuff of research and of practical problem solving. Uh, have you tackled uh, uh, any problems that you felt called for unusually novel solutions? You came up with something you might consider, you might, or you might call it a neat trick or something like that. Very unusual way of doing Well, I think problem. my revealed operant approach is, is a solution to a lot of such problems. For example, um, we've always talked, ever since I was an undergraduate, people have talked about what is, a re what is reinforcement? How does reinforcement work? In fact, one of the, one of the comments that Schoenfeld always made at least on two or three occasions I heard him make in, in classes, is, you know, Schoenfeld is always a sort of a, uh, he always tries to be provocative and uh, challenging. And he said, we don't even know how a single reinforcer affects a single response <laughs> to, to stress the fact that learning theory is in its infancy. That's why he, he said that. Um, but there was no way at that time of asking that question. You know, if we try to address experimentally or give meaning to the question, how does a single reinforcer affect a single response? You can't answer that. You can't ask or answer that question by using instantaneous operands, such as single bar presses and single, single switch closure type responses. But if you use a a revealed operant, an operant that has a f its own fingerprint, you know, its own identity, so that you can say this one, this occurrence is different from that occurrence, but it's the same as an earlier, or it's similar to an earlier occurrence. Then you can begin to ask that type of question. So I think the revealed operant is is a technique that lends itself to that kind of question: uh, What does a reinforcer do? Could you tell me, uh, in this case, where you've, you've talked about these single bar presses, mm -hmm. these electrical switch closures yes. and so on, uh, what would be a useful, how would you describe a useful revealed operant in this case? What would you look for? In well, one, one uh, uh, type of revealed operant we worked with a lot is uh, a human subject at a, at a computer keyboard. He presses uh, the space bar with his thumb. That's, we call it RA, R sub A. Mm -hmm. Then he presses some combination of character keys on the keyboard. Um, those are the RBs. But which ones he presses are up to him. Mm -hmm. Maybe he has to press a certain minimum number. Then to end the operant, he presses the uh, return key, maybe with his pinky. So it's, it's thumb. Mm -hmm. boop, boop, and and the pinky. I understand. Uh, now that can be done. A subject can do that in one second. Um, and uh, with that kind of an operand, you can look at patterns, like w the rhythms with which the RBs are executed. You know, computers can can do a lot of calculations on identifying rhythms and sequences and patterns. So we have methods now for having the computer analyze such data uh, so that we can uh, uh, identify the, the various patterns that occur within these occurrences of operants. If I understand you correctly, this same uh, kind of uh, description, uh, same kind of uh, uh, yeah, description would apply to uh, 
playing the piano for the sequences in a, in a piano? Well, I, I wouldn't want to equate that with an operant. Um, uh -huh. the, the, there are principles, of course, uh, that, like that you learn player. with the reveal, that you can learn with the revealed operant. But the revealed operant is a laboratory tool. It's a research yeah, tool. It's nothing more than that. Mm -hmm. But when yeah. you deal with complex performance like language mm -hmm. and piano playing and tennis, mm -hmm. uh, you don't deal with discrete units that get no. repeated over and over. You, d you deal with a flow of behavior which is honed, which is shaped, and which is polished, and which uh, follows models uh, uh, that the learner emulates. Uh, so the principles that you can learn with the revealed operant in a laboratory setting can then be applied. Can apply to that yes. in okay. in more mm -hmm. in in the shaping of more complex performances. Uh, could you uh, pinpoint some? You might say approximate dates or time spans on some of this work that you've done. The the revealed operant and uh, some of the other. Uh, uh, yeah, well, things. the, the notation, notation system I did in 1958. Mm -hmm. um, I did the whole thing in '58. I, uh, um, the uh, work with the revealed operant, uh, I began that in uh, at Columbia when I started talking about multi-response operants, and I had a laboratory at Charing Corporation for four and a half years, which I which I ran during that same period of time. Uh, I built and ran that lab, and there I I continued the work on looking at units of behavior larger than the single in a single switch closure. Uh, then when I formed basic systems, I really stopped my laboratory research. And I made a long, long pause until just a few years ago when I picked it up again. And <coughs> when I picked it up again in, um, I guess it was in 88, 89, I picked up where that thread where I left off and called it the revealed operant because I wanted to stress I use that term to stress the fact that you're revealing the internal structure by the way you define it. It's sort of like a radioactive tracer. Uh, that's one, one analogy. Uh, it's like putting a microscope to the operant. Uh, defining the operant in such a way that you can look at its in insides, at its, at its mm -hmm. internal structure. So uh, that's why I use the term revealed operant. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I've been working on that ever since with uh, I began with the people of the University of North Texas uh, through the efforts of Sigrid Glenn, and uh, I worked with a crew there uh, consisting of uh, Cloyd Hyten, Doug Field, and Greg Madden, um, who carried the ball on, on that research. And I just worked with them. I w visited them frequently. And, um, and then um, it was picked up at uh, Barnard and uh, working a bit with Columbia and uh, and some other places that I mentioned before. Okay, uh, uh. when you were oh uh, yes, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, as for the performance learning work, mm -hmm. okay, just to finish your, the answer to your mm -hmm. question, um, I began that in '77 in earnest um, with piano. I, I, I gave I was asked to give a piano recital at that time, so that sort of focused my attention mm -hmm. on how one learns piano performance. And that got me, that pulled me into the whole field of performance learning and it's mm -hmm. become a, a, a major interest since that time. Um, and my work in uh, educational technology, the program learning stuff, the program instruction work, that began in, I began that in, um, in 59. I uh, went into high gear during the early 60s when I built basic systems. And um, after I sold it to Xerox, I continued um, at a lower level, but I continued working in, in, in behavioral technology and behavioral analysis especially. I developed training materials and course materials for teaching people to do behavioral, ana behavioral analysis of learning and knowledge. Oh, you, you mentioned the Sharing Corporation. Is that the drug corporation? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, what were the years when you built and uh, My, ran that line? Uh, I I was hired by Sharing in '56 uh, when I got my PhD. R right after, uh, even before I had my PhD, they hired me, um, and uh, they gave me a big budget to build a psychopharmacology lab, and I did. I built a, psych a computerized, automated psychopharmacology lab there over over a four and a half year period. Mm -hmm. So from '56 to to '61. To in fact. I 
I left on April 61 when, when my new company, Basic Systems, uh, needed 110% of my time. What uh, a kind of um, re behavioral research did you do at the laboratory, at the Shearing Laboratory? A lot of uh, psychopharmacology, testing the effects of drugs on behavior. On uh, animal subjects? Uh, animals, monkeys, and humans. We I had all, all three species. Mm -hmm. And we usually did analogous experiments with the three species so as to get comparisons and see similarities and differences. Mm -hmm. What three species are the, are the um, humans? And rats, uh, rats, monkeys, and, uh, and, and ladies. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh -huh. Is this sexist or in some way? <laughs> no, we hired uh, retired sharing workers. At, oh, really? Uh, at, okay. Yes, at nickel per reinforcement. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's fascinating. Uh, in all of your work, uh, have you found any failure of uh, behavior analysis principles? Oh, principles don't fail. It's people who fail. Okay. Uh, that's uh, a good way of putting it. Um, I think, uh, of course, there's been a lot of research that, that led nowhere that, that was dead end, uh, but that's true in every field. You know, the most difficult, um, the most difficult challenge in any field of science is to know, uh, as you navigate the labyrinth, the maze, which, which uh, uh, alleys will lead into cul-de-sacs and which mm -hmm. alleys will lead you to uh, an open vista where you can go further. And uh, that's been true in in this field as well as in many other fields, in every other field. Um, well, were there any? Uh, uh, s problems you felt that weren't addressed by operant methods, problems you ran into where there was no no clue in any of the operant literature. Oh yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. What would be some most of, of the really important and difficult issues in the field of performance mm -hmm. learning are not addressed by by the work that's been done in 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 the in the behavior analysis field. Uh, that work has taken me into into neuropsychology into the literature of motor, called motor behavior, although it isn't all motor. Mm -hmm. But there was a field called motor behavior, because it began there. Uh, yeah, but it's now it. a much broader, wider field, which uh, is beginning to merge with neuropsychology, with how the nervous system uh, f uh, interacts with, uh, with behavior. Uh, uh, there's a great deal of work in the cognitive, what is called cognitive fields, uh, and in the field of perception. Perception and cognitive and neuropsychology are sort of overlapping and interacting in, in many ways. And I would say that most of the knowledge that's relevant to making progress in performance, in, in, the, in skilled performance learning, does not come from behavior analysis. Uh, so one of my great interests uh, or activities right now really is to is to learn and study the literatures of these other fields. What other fields would be examples? Motor behavior, neuropsychology. Oh, I see. Yes. Sir. And uh, and per perception and cognition. Yeah. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Those four, I would say, those four fields, which are gradually merging. They are not. They are not as distinct as they used to be. Um, so those uh, those fields are providing a great deal of uh, of the input of the theoretical underpinnings uh, uh, for progress in, in in the field of skilled performance learning. In, in the behavioral programs uh, that you've um, developed, have you um, uh, do any of them involve your training other staff in how to apply the methods or use the methods? You mean as I work with uh, with these university groups? Uh, yes. Or, or you say you've developed a method or and a pr or a procedure or something, and now you're going to take it and give it to some other group to apply. Well, we usually work together as collaborators. Uh, mm -hmm. Somebody has to be interested and mm -hmm. uh, has to already be interested in, in using it or doing something with it, and then I work with them. And um, I wouldn't say I train them. These are all fine scientists, you know mm -hmm. who. In some cases, no more than I do. Uh, but you uh, don't have the uh, situation of taking lay people and teaching them how to use these methods? No, or? no. 
Oh, yes. Well, oh, pianists, okay. of course. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And many people interested in applying these principles of performance learning, like, for example, chess players or go players. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I teach them how to teach. I teach them how to help their students make rapid progress and develop the desired performance uh, and to make sure that the performance is stable and resistant to disruption. Yes, I, mm -hmm. I, I've taught a lot of people who are laymen in in our field, in psychology, uh, to implement uh, some of these principles, yes, and apply them in their own fields, in which they are not laymen, in which I'm the layman. <laughs> Uh, when you set up these programs and then go off and leave them, as you must, uh, to do the other things you do, uh, have you found any drift? Do they seem tend to slip in their application of the principles you've taught them? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, because uh, laymen, as you call them, often don't know what's important and what isn't. They take my word for it, and then they... Uh, they have to explore. They have to see which corners can be cut, which <laughs> corners can they, can they get away with cutting and still get good results. And sometimes I learn something from that. You know, sometimes I am surprised that you can cut corners and still it, it can sti it'll still work. Uh, so that, that does happen, sure. How many people do you, would you say that you have trained in uh, these techniques, uh, in these examples you've used? How many? Oh, it, it's in the dozens. Mm -hmm. Not in the hundreds yet, uh, because I'm still in the early stages uh, in, in the, that sense. Uh, have you experienced any ethical objections to controlling behavior? No. Uh, have you found any objections uh, raised uh, by about the subject of using methods that were originally developed on animals uh, to modify human performances? It doesn't come up. Uh, what, what comes up is, does, does this approach work or doesn't it work? <laughs> okay. yeah. That's a good I, I don't talk approach. about animals. Yeah. I, I talk about what to do. I mean, when it comes to practical applications. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever encountered any uh, place where you've run into an administrative roadblock or any administrative objection to introducing a program of this sort? Say if you took it into a company or... Well, you know, school. no matter what you try to introduce, you, encou you encounter administrative roadblocks, it, but, I, I, but not because something is behavioral or mm -hmm. uh, just because change and new techniques and new methods are always resisted uh, everywhere by everyone. It doesn't have to be uh, just in our field. I mean, if an engineer tries to propose a new way of doing something that'll work better, well, there'll be resistance. Mm -hmm. you know, that type just of thing. Just because. Uh, was there any event in your career starting, let's say, even from your college days, wh which dramatically changed his direction? Which dramatically any, any event in your career uh, that has dramatically changed its direction, the direction of your career? Oh, of my career. Uh, well, yeah, what I mentioned earlier, when I was doing uh, Heffaline's experiments in self-awareness, that, oh. that convinced oh. me that I, yeah. I should not go into, say, medicine or whatever I might have gone into and go mm -hmm. instead into research, into science. And that was back uh, in your undergraduate days. That was when I was uh, when I was twenty-one. Yeah, yeah. Or twenty. Now, in your uh, uh, experimental work and uh, the applications you've uh, explored, have there been any totally unexpected happenings, real sh startling surprises? Mm, you mean in my research, or do you mean e either one, or in your uh, uh, when you've taken it outside the laboratory? You might say to to help people learn how to play the piano, or whatever you're going to be doing. Any startling um, occurrence? Well, I'm always startled when something works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, what well, doesn't work? I, doesn't I, w I would work. say okay. I find everything startling. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, good. Uh, you can go around <laughs> perpetually with your eyes, but yeah. <laughs> um, perhaps I asked you this before. Uh, I asked you about your most significant accomplishment. What do you consider your most significant publication? Oh, I don't think there's any one. Um, the notation system papers, uh, a couple of those, um, I think were 
pretty good. Um, uh, the recent publication on the revealed operant, there's a, I wrote it up as a monograph, which is published by the Cambridge Center for Behavioral Studies. What's the date of that one? Um, last year, um, oh. 1992. Um, and um, I haven't yet published this stuff on performance learning. I've written version after version of my book, but I haven't yet published it. But soon, within a year, um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, and then there were a bunch of research papers I did, which I liked, uh, which were published in JAB uh, uh, on counting and time estimation and uh, time counting and timing in, in animals and the effect of, of drive on counting and timing and just dissecting you know, a number of those that I like. But um, I don't know quite what else to point to. Uh, um, I published some things on uh, on behavioral analysis, which uh, I thought put it, you know, put it succinctly. But that's about it. What, at this point, do you consider to be the overall significance of your work? Well, the notation system is just that. It's just a notation system, which is a tool for analyzing and communicating. You say you use it, so you, you know what that yes, is. Yes, I, I'm, I use parts of it, parts at least. Of it, and yeah. yes, I, I'm not sure I use it in its pure form. Um, I've been exposed and to. in um, in the field of uh, programmed learning and programmed instruction, as I said, I think that there my biggest contribution was, well, my initial contribution was pointing out that the machine wasn't necessary. And then mm -hmm. a lot of people picked that up. That was pretty obvious, I guess. I, I, that didn't require me to point that out. Um, but the work on uh, behavioral analysis, how to analyze knowledge and skill, I think was useful. Uh, uh, the revealed operand, I think, will be a will be a valuable research tool. I hope will be a valuable research tool. I think it has that potential. Uh, uh, there are many uses to which you can put that, as that monograph that I just mm -hmm. mentioned explains. And then, um, in the performance learning area, um, that work I think will uh, I hope will eventually be picked up by many performance disciplines, uh, sports. Uh, coaches, musical performers, uh, language teaching, um, uh, and other skill, skill teaching. Uh, if you had your academic and professional life to do over again, would you do anything differently? Probably. Um, I would probably not go into, go into business again. Uh, I underestimated how much time that would take away from my, from my research. Uh, in those 30 or 35 years that I've been involved in in business and entrepreneurial endeavors. Uh, I've had to um, I've had to curtail my my research quite extensively, and it's really only in recent years that I've been able to to pick up the thread again and and become semi-active again. So if I had to do over, I would probably just have confined myself to research. Uh, although. Who knows what? <laughs> maybe, maybe I did the right thing. You never know in retrospect because there's no control group. I, I don't, I don't have another Francis Mechner to tell me how it would have worked out the other way. <laughs> exactly. Oh, uh, what would? How would you advise a student who wanted to go into a career like yours? How sort of preparation would such a student? Well, do? what's my career like? I don't uh, know. Uh, <laughs> yours is rather different. I'm having trouble with that I, myself. I don't know what my career really is. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I'm able to do what I'm doing now because I, I have enough financial resources to permit me to do that without having to, to get a salary. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not uh, on salary from any institution. I'm just an independent uh, researcher. And I can do that because I have my companies, uh, my entrepreneurial uh, activities to, to support that. Um, but I paid a big price for that. Uh, you know, I gave up a lot of years of my life and a lot of energy and time Certainly. in order to achieve that. So where's the trade-off? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let's put it another way. Here you have a young person, a high school student or early college, uh, wanting to become a behavior analyst and get into some of these research or practical activities like uh, you've been engaged in. 
uh, how would you advise such a student to prepare himself academically or in terms of other kinds of experiences? Well, I think my primary uh, recommendation would be today to look beyond what is generally defined as or delineated as behavior analysis. Um, I believe that really important strides, huge strides, are now being made in, in the fields I mentioned earlier, neuropsychology, um, perception, motor behavior, uh, cognition. Uh, those are very active fields, and it's a mistake uh, to consider them separate or irrelevant. They are not. They deal with behavior just as surely as behavior analysis deals with behavior. And they deal with problems and issues and, and mechanisms that are, that are vital, that are of great importance and great interest. So whenever anybody asks me, you know, where should I plunge? You know, where should I go? Where should I look? I always say, look, look far beyond. Take off, your, take off the blinders that normally people normally wear in any field, not just in behavior analysis. <laughs> Every field has its own blinders. You take them off and, and, and look beyond those, li those, those limits. Uh, because uh, in 20 or 30 years, none of these fields will, will be identified as as separate anymore. There will be a merging, a, a, a diffusion, so much diffusion across the boundaries of these fields that they will no, no longer be identifiable as single fields. That's already happening now. And um, for somebody who will be active in, in 10, 20, 30 years, they better start now or they will be left out of the mainstream. So that's, that's recommendation number one, I would say. And then uh, the second recommendation is, is don't get swept away with techniques or, or fads or fashions, um, but but never stop asking, what are the important question? What is the important question? What what question are we trying to answer? What are we trying to be able to do or figure out? And then go after that, rather than just use a technique because somebody else has done something similar. Um, well, whom do you think you have influenced? I don't know. Um, I just know the people I know um, who are interested in what I'm doing. Uh, the people I work with in the various universities, I guess I've influenced them by definition because they're working with me on projects. Um, uh, maybe I've influenced the people who use my notation system, but again, that's just a tool. That's I, I think that's kind of trivial. It's a, it's like a, you know, it's, it's clever and it's useful, but it's not, f it's not a scientific advance. It, it has no empirical content. It, um, it's just a formal system, um, like a type of mathematics, but it's not, it doesn't tell you anything about the real world. <laughs> Understand. Um, and in performance learning, I've influenced a lot of teachers and a lot of performers who, who now use my methods and, and, and find them very, very useful. Uh, so uh, I guess that's as much as I know about who I've influenced. What groups of people would you like to influence? Uh, serious scientists. Um, I'd like to help uh, people who are interested in, in discovering new knowledge to do so. To I'd like to give them tools and, and chart paths for them that will take them in, in productive directions and, and make progress as they go in those directions. Uh, um, I'm at an age where I guess I get, I'm more and more interested in making sure that others make progress because I've maybe, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know how many years of doing that I've got left myself. Uh, uh, you know, when you're very young, you think you're going to conquer the whole world, but then as you, as you get to a certain point, you realize, well, you can't do it alone, and others have, <laughs> are going to pick up. And 
So now my interest is in, um, in uh, providing people with tools that will help them make progress in, in relevant and interesting directions. Do you use uh, behavior anal analytic principles in your everyday life? Well, I, I don't know uh, how I would not. Uh, you mean do I use, ever use reinforcement? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, or uh, any of the other principles. Uh, uh, or punishment <laughs> or, uh, or discrimination. Yes, I would, okay. say, I, I would say about five times a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can't live without it. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, do you use these methods with your friends and family and coworkers? Well, when you say these methods, you probably mm -hmm. mean uh, sort of planning behavioral contingencies to to manipulate the behavior. I would. Say, I, I don't think I'm. Maybe I do it unconsciously, uh, like we all do. You know, we we smile at people, uh, <laughs> hoping that they'll like us more, or, <laughs> or we frown at them when when we don't want them. To <laughs> so, I I guess I do, like everybody else does. Do you think the field of behavior analysis has been uh, successful in solving human problems? Oh yeah, I think um, I think uh, the field of behavior analysis, even as it is defined today, or it has been as it has been recently defined, has has made tremendous contributions in in education and behavior management, um, in some areas of, of animal training, maybe. Um, but if you take, if you go to educational technology, you know, something like even programmed learning and program instruction, and what I call behavioral analysis, much of that does not really come from, from the field of behavioral analysis. Um, Not direct. It doesn't come directly from the laboratory. It comes more from uh, from conceptualizations such as those of Hull. You know, for example, a concept. What what is a concept? Look, if you look at Keller and Schoenfeld, and you read about concept formation, that's not Skinner's work. That's Hull's work. You know, it's um, okay. Is that behavior? Yeah, I guess that's behavior analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. On a rating scale, again, from one to four, with four being the high end, uh, how successful do you think these methods have been? Well, you'd have to ask in doing what, in accomplishing mm -hmm. what. Uh, I can't say, you know, it's hard for me to think of success in a vacuum. Uh, um, these methods have been very successful in certain uh, circumscribed applications. Uh, but for example, if if you ask it in relation to the field of performance learning, which is one of my specialties, mm -hmm. I would say that behavior analysis has maybe is responsible for twenty percent of, of of the contribution there, or maybe even less. Whereas the fields of motor behavior, the literature from motor behavior and uh, perception and um, well, to some extent, cognition and neuropsychology have uh, maybe made a larger contribution there than, mm -hmm. than behavior analysis has. But I, I don't know how to distinguish them. You know, as I, even as I speak, I, I'm, it's not mm -hmm. clear to me what, what concept belongs in which field. You know, they all I sometimes, uh, sometimes different fields use different terminologies to talk about similar phenomena, and they look at the elephant from different <laughs> angles. <laughs> Um, and they deal with different parts of the elephant. So, you know, who's more important, the one who identified the trunk or the one who identified the tail? You know, <laughs> if you look at them together, it, it becomes a mosaic, a picture that you can make sense out of. Can you think of fields uh, uh, or m ways in which uh, behavior analysis could become more useful in solving human problems? by looking beyond its own confines. It's the same thing I said before. I think behavior analysis needs to look beyond its nose um, and, and to take off the blinders. Uh, I keep preaching that. I keep telling, I mean, many of my colleagues agree with me wholeheartedly uh, and, and preach the same message. But I think it's now high time 
for behavior analysts to look beyond the confines, beyond the boundaries that have been drawn by, by others. Uh, Do you see any, indiv any one individual on the horizon who might uh, uh, take uh, B.F. Skinner's place or at least fill his shoes in something? Th nobody can or should uh, take Skinner's place. You can't take, uh, you know, who took Freud's place? You, you, <laughs> you can't take the place of a guy like that, you know, with really important scientists. Uh, there will be other important scientists in the future who will do other things, who will uh, make other kinds of contributions. But um, you know, Skinner did, one th did something very important, very, very interesting, and that's it. <laughs> Are you optimistic about the future of the field? Uh, when you say the field, uh, I have, I, I look at the field more broadly than just what is today typically mm -hmm. defined as behavior analysis. In other All words, right. if well, you just, just the whole if behavioral if field, let's say. Well, if you take the whole mm -hmm. behavioral field, there are enormous, rapid strides being made by thousands of scientists all over the world, really good scientists. Uh, not just in this country, in Europe, in England, all over the world, in Japan, um, many of them in the United States. But they don't call themselves behaviorists or behavior analysts. They call themselves neuropsychologists, neuroscientists, um, cognitive psychologists, uh, 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 they, they, you, you know, you just look at all the different research fields, uh, and even even uh, even uh, uh, biochemists make contributions now. They work with neuroscientists, and and a lot of the m the important phenomena that we will become more and more interested in as the years go by are now at the at the neurochemical level. Um, so um, if you if you define the field that broadly. Well, th that's where the future is. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's, where, that's where the knowledge we need is going to come from. OK. Uh, could you try another one of these rating scales, one to four? <laughs> of what? Uh, uh, of uh, your optimism, your level of optimism. Oh, it, it's, it's not, uh, it's certainty. I mean, science has to give us the, uh, it, I'll put it this way. Science must give us the answers that, uh, that we need. Science will will teach us more and more about whatever we want to know. It is, I believe, in, in, in science as a method, um, as opposed to other ways of <laughs> trying to discover truth. <laughs> All uh, right. So uh, there's no question in my mind that science will give us the answers. Uh, so you'd give it a four. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, well, this brings us right into the next subject. Uh, most people don't seem to have a clear, very clear idea of what science is all about, the average person in the street, let's say. Uh, could you help clear up the confusion by giving us your definition of science? Well, the, the, the only definition of science I've ever heard that makes any sense to me is, is trying to find out what you want to know by, in any way you can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and that encompasses all of science. All right. <laughs> uh, I don't think there's any one method of science that, that is always applicable in every situation. I think one adapts one's methods and techniques to the particular problem being, to the particular question being answered, trying to, that you're trying to answer. What about technology? How does that differ from science? Technology is, is, is using science to make things happen. What's been the impact of science on your own life? And I'm talking about science as a whole now. You don't mean just do I watch TV and, uh, and, no. and do I <laughs> use automobiles? Um, but that's one of the impacts. You know, yes, I mean, obviously. as a user, as a consumer of science, mm -hmm. we, we all know what that mm -hmm. is. But so you mean the impact of, well, what do you mean? Let me ask you. What, what <laughs> uh, well, that's a good question, too. I think the, what I'm talking about is how do you feel about your life in a world of science as opposed to to what your life might be like without a world of science? Well, without a world of science, I'd be living in a cave, I guess. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, what about the world as a whole? 
Well, the impact on the, I, I guess it would be somewhat similar. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, we uh, even cavemen use science. Mm. I mean, they. Yeah. How did they figure out that the cave is better than, than an open field? You know, uh, here with the impact on the world, I think I'm looking at uh, perhaps uh, uh, what do you, th do you think the impact of science on the world of, as a whole has been uh, favorable or unfavorable, good or bad? Well, again, it depends on, on whether you feel that um, using fire and the wheel and uh, and so forth is better than not using it. Uh, I, I don't think science is any one thing. It's just figuring out how to do things. Um, so if we, if we had never fig learned how to figure out how to do things, we would be apes, uh, I guess, or something. But uh, although apes have <laughs> science too, I guess they do. Chimps, <laughs> uh, chimps use straws to get to get ants out of holes, right? That's right. that's a kind of science. I suppose it is. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, well, uh, what do you think the average person in the street's concept of science is? Well, I guess you have to ask what street. You know, I think you'd get a yeah. different answer <laughs> in the streets of uh, certainly of Baghdad than in the streets of. Um, of of New York. I guess I'm talking about the average American at this point. Well, I guess the stereotype is what they get in the media. You know, uh, the way the scientist is depicted in the media as um, as somebody who is either a doctor or uh, who uh, saves a life or. Uh, or a mad scientist who wants to blow up the world, or <laughs> you know, there are all mm -hmm. kinds of stereotypes of scientists and that, that are promulgated by the media to the man on the street. What do you think we can do about this? Well, I think that um, we need to teach parents how to teach their children uh, how to behave rationally, how to ask questions in a systematic, orderly way, collect data, and how to be scientists. Children are scientists, normally. Some I mean, of the best. <laughs> yes, they, they are, if you observe children, they are, they are very good scientists. They really are very efficient in finding out what they need to know. Um, and they can get more and more sophisticated and skilled if, if they have parents and teachers who, who help them and let them make their own progress and don't squelch them. So I think it begins there. Um, I don't think it requires a special public relations effort. Uh, of course, there are also forces in, in our society that, uh, that denigrate science, that, uh, that uh, pit science against religion and so on and so forth and create attitudes in people that are inimical to to science, but um, how does one curb that? I don't know. Uh, but I think it all begins in the home, and uh, if any effort is to be made, I'm a strong believer that the parent is is the central and most important influence in a in in the development of of a child's personality and knowledge and perception of the world. Okay. Now, there's one question I failed to ask earlier that I should have that I'm going to in here. Um, do you feel that there are any major barriers uh, in the field of behavioral science uh, that make it difficult for women and members of minority groups to enter the field? I'm not aware of that. Um, it may be that there are, but again, I think that would probably be different in different places and different mm -hmm. institutions. Uh, so I'm not part of that scene, so I, I don't yes, I have much special knowledge of that. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. McFarland. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure. Your time, but it was a great privilege for you're, us. You're an excellent We've enjoyed interviewer. It. Well, thank you. <laughs>
so that they will have an impact where the impact can register, namely on children. Uh, I think it's very difficult to change the, the, the already formed attitudes of adults in any society. Um, it takes, it's very costly and usually ineffective to try to change the attitudes of people whose opinions are already fixed and set. But it's, it's extremely easy to have an impact on the attitudes and opinions of children. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where personality is really formed and where attitudes are really shaped. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, if any effort is to be made to uh, uh, improve our society's um, receptivity towards science or uh, attitude towards science, it's the next generation that should be the target. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the reasons we're doing what we're doing is to try to reach younger groups. Now, you know, there's a, a limit to how young we can reach with the, yes. the material that we have. Uh, what sorts of questions you're now familiar with our interview and, and the approach that we are, are using to get the information, mm -hmm. what questions do you feel that we should ask in order to influence the up-and-coming scientists, the, the, the scientists of the future? Uh, we happen to feel that there is some antagonism towards science in, in our society, and I don't know whether it's a matter of, of elitism or, or, or the like that seems to exist, whether it's the media. What questions do you feel that we should ask what answers should we deliver to our consumer, the mm -hmm. young budding scientist, that will help the cause of science, future science? It's an interesting question. Um, I would, I guess my approach would be first to find out what is the basis of that antagonism? Which groups are antagonistic in what ways, for what reasons? And then to, to direct the message to each of those groups uh, rifle targeting those mm -hmm. reasons and those, those behavioral dynamics. Uh, I doubt that a single question and answer or message mm -hmm. will be effective for all the segments of the target population you are identifying when you when you say that. we have 200 questions in that book and we <laughs> yes. ask a small yes <laughs> oh don't forget your still shot I will. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but um, I think uh, maybe the questions and answers that would influence young people most would be those having to do with models uh, young people of the human species uh, are susceptible to being inspired by models, to emulating individuals they can identify with or admire or, or, or uh, aspire to. And uh, maybe the most effective way you can influence young people to either accept science or want to become scientists themselves is to show them models in a biographical sense. Uh, uh, of people whose footsteps they might want to follow. Um, on the other hand, from the standpoint of influencing of the next generation of younger individuals, there I think the best way is to go through parents and maybe also through uh, teachers of kindergarten, nursery school, elementary school. Um, and then one has to ask, how does one reach those parents and, and teachers of nursery, kindergarten, elementary school. How does one reach them? Well, maybe through schools of education. In the case of parents, it's more difficult. I've tried that too in my <laughs> career.